But we are going to start. Uh, my name is Lee Adams. I'm the vice chair of the commission. Our chair is late, but um, without um, further ado, I'm going to introduce our first presenter, Dean Rene. Thank you. I, I, I'm sort of excited, not sort of, I am excited about this because I don't get to teach anymore. So this is basically a lecture. There will be an exam at the end, and we have 80% pass rate or else. Uh, it already looks like it's all C's. It's straight it's, it's, down the from. All C's. Um, this is also exciting for me because it allows the commissioners and others to talk about their specialties. Right, to hear Alan Hess go on and on and on about you know mid-century modern architecture it was awesome. Don't get me wrong. Uh, this allows us to sort of delve a little bit into the insanity of each individual that's on the commission, but also gives us the, the information that we need to examine these nominations uh, more informed manner. Um, so, as an archaeologist by training, they've asked me to talk about the archaeological record, what do archaeologists do? And I do have about a million slides, so please forgive me, but I will rapidly go through them. And Adam uh, Shiro to talk about how the archaeological record then is used in the nomination process. And he'll, he has a, a bunch of slides here. And then Greg Castro, uh, from the Native American perspective, will talk about you know how it, the linear, linearity of A, B, and C, and D might not work so well. And sometimes it encompasses all of that when we look at traditional cultural properties when we look at uh, things that are deeply meaningful to people. Um, and so I will begin on the, perhaps the most boring side of it, the archaeology. What is archaeology? We need to talk about the basics of it, right? It, it's the study of the things that people have left behind. Right? The things that they made, the things they brought in from somewhere else, uh, sometimes human remains. Uh, but it's not treasure hunting. Even though there are programs on, on various History Channel and whatnot that show people doing just that, to a trained archaeologist, treasure hunting, it's, that's not what it's about. It's about history. It's about people. It's about reconstructing, based on the things that people left behind, what their life was like. To be able to talk to an individual, and, and hopefully we do this in the course of our lives, we find out there's so much about a person. And rarely does an archaeologist get to find that in the archaeological record. That's the envy, right? You know, knowing that, well, wait a minute, the things that I wear, the bracelets, they all have a meaning, a personal meaning to me. And when we find these things in the archaeological record, we don't know that personal meaning. We don't know what that thing meant to an individual. Uh, so it's more about the stories that we can reconstruct, however lacking they are, from the things that people left behind, and not about the so-called treasures. Even though the beginning of archaeology really started off in that way, those, those, those blingy things that you could put into a museum, right? Uh, so we have various goals, right? We want to study human behavior. We want to explain change uh, based on the things that people left behind. And most importantly, for my role here as a commissioner, is we want to preserve archaeological sites. Uh, we want to preserve the artifacts, the ecofacts, the features, the meaningful things to people that were left behind. And, and, and you can see there are various pictures of all these things. I won't go into detail. Some you will recognize, some you might not. Uh, but let's explain a little bit about why it's meaningful. Because these are the untold stories of the past. Right? Uh, I have, you can go on, on Ancestry.com or you could do your DNA. You can find all kinds of really interesting things in there. You might look at an old journal. Uh, you might be able to go to the library, look in the stacks and find something out about people. You might look at a painting to, to decide to, to figure out what it was like 500 years ago. All of these things begin to paint a picture about people that can no longer tell their story. And so for me as a young kid, I was fascinated by that potential. Right? It started, my father took me to Mexico, I was on a big pyramid in Chichen Itza, and literally at 15 years old, had this spiritual moment. I closed my eyes and I imagined the sights, the sounds, the smells, I could hear dogs barking, they took me into a psychologist after that, but whatever, that's another story. Um, but I really did have a connection to the past, and, and I knew at that point that I wanted to study archaeology, and I wanted to give voice um, when I thought, arrogantly thought, voices uh, weren't heard. Um, and so we studied the physical remains, but these could be buildings, right? Uh, they could be ruins. Uh, part of my research more recently 
has been on Shell Middens in Baja, California, and then an early ecclesiastical site in County Donegal, Ireland. Totally different archaeologies, but each are silent for the most part in, in the stories they can tell. And so to be able to use the methods, the tools that archaeologists use to reconstruct those stories, it's a fascinating uh, part of my life. Um, and so what does it consist of, the archaeology? I, I don't use human remains. And so I'm not going to put a picture of a skeleton there. It's just not what I do. Uh, but artifacts, there's those things that have been modified by humans, from a pencil to the clothes that you're wearing to those lanyards you have around to the hat. Uh, so all these things, these are artifacts. There's things that are modified by humans. Ecofacts, plenty of things called ecofacts in archaeological sites. And it's made up sometimes of faunal remains, animal remains that aren't modified, but they're the refuge of what people ate, perhaps, what they processed, or maybe geological objects, things were brought to a site. Um, now, features are a little bit more complex. Features are a combination of association of artifacts and or ecofacts, and if you pull them out of context, they lose their meaning. So you can see here, there's some burned rocks. Uh, if I pull out a burned rock and, and show it to everyone, you can say, uh, it's a rock that was burned, right? Uh, however, when I put it back in its context, you say, oh, maybe it's a firefly. That becomes personally and socially more meaningful. It's a place where people gather for heat, for cooking, to tell stories, to make artifacts. Now you're starting to piece things together in a way that is much more meaningful to human beings. And so features are those complex associations of artifacts and or ecofacts that really allow us to begin to, to carve out a story of the past. Lots of different material types artifacts are made of. Glass, metal, clay, I don't need to, to, to name all of these things. All of them, including textiles that often don't preserve in the archaeological record. All of these things help us to reconstruct what people did in the past. Uh, and they're the fascinating part of doing archaeology, because you can be descriptive. It is, you can describe its color, you can measure it, you can quantify it, and you can be analytical about it. You can put it through a variety of different uh, analyses to get at some of the things you can't see. And I'll have an example of that later. Now the project itself, uh, it's been aimed to discover, to describe, to interpret, to preserve. And so when you go into it as a group of archaeologists go into a particular project, those are the those and others are the four main goals, right? To discover, because we don't always know where archaeological sites are. To describe, to describe it as, as detailed as possible. Photography, note-taking, all these become part of the archaeological record when archaeologists engage in the study of archaeology. And then to interpret what it all means, sometimes in, in, in ways that are are, are are meaningful to people that are alive today, and sometimes in ways that are esoteric, and then ultimately to preserve. Why? Because we want to leave these things, these sites, not totally excavated for future generations or for people whose ancestors came from these places to decide what is to be done with these sites, whether they be left alone and never studied again, which is totally fine, or whether they're studied as part of the preservation process. Preservation in place only goes so far if you don't understand what's there in an archaeological site. And sites, when we actually work in archaeological sites, we, 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 just, we want to know its location, how old the site is, what was done there, what did people do at the particular site, and who used it. These are all meaningful things to then help construct a nomination, and all, all the nominations will have something like this in the location, the age, the function, and the people that used it, or the peoples that used it, multiple people that used these places. So what is an archaeological site? It's, it's a place where activities took place. Right? Uh, sometimes these are ritual activities. Sometimes these are basic function activities, like we're eating. Sometimes we're building. Uh, sometimes it's a place to sleep. And sometimes it's ephemeral, meaning it was just used for a brief moment in time and then left. Uh, you can imagine when you have a, it, of course, no, no one here litters. But if you went to a park and you went under an oak tree and every week you went there on a Friday and you went with a group of friends and each of your friends sat in the same areas each and every time and you left your food behind, that would build up over time. And we would need to understand that as the incredible social event that took place or maybe we misinterpret it, right? Maybe it's, it's something we don't understand what took place there. So everything that you do 
if it's left behind, ultimately will lead to the building of an archaeological site. And they're further defined by these combinations, as we defined earlier, eco-facts, artifacts, and features, and or human remains. I've never excavated a human body in my life. I have no intention to do so. I don't want to. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in sort of the relationship between past human societies and the environment. What was going on? Uh, what was that relationship like? As environments changed, how did people change their technology? How did they change their, their economy? All of these different types of things. Uh, and that defines what archaeological sites are for the most part. In some sites, you'll have specific activity areas, like that example I gave you about the lunch spot under an oak tree. A specific activity area is that something took place. Uh, and it's discreet, it's meaningful, and you can understand it separate from the broader sort of uh, context of, of, of like a trash dump or something like that. Um, something where maybe uh, somebody fitted out a projectile point or, or made beads and the bead detritus or the, or the trash left behind is left there. Those are meaningful social, personal activities that took place that in an archaeological site you're able to, to gather some of that evidence and interpret it. And there are differences between what we call primary deposits, things that were deposits for specific reasons, perhaps not to be uncovered by archaeologists, right? Uh, for specific reasons, perhaps to be left in the ground forever. Uh, and then secondary refuge, which are a lot of the work that I do is in, in what we term middens, or because I'm a coastal and island archaeologist, so-called trash heaps. Uh, and there's lots of really good information in those trash heaps. If you can imagine going through your trash today, all the meaningful things that we could say about you, what you drank, what you ate, why you threw things away, and maybe you don't want that trash to be looked at by somebody else. Um, but that's, that's sort of what these deposits can give you in terms of uh, reconstructing the past. Now, sometimes archaeological sites might be very so discreet that, that yes, it represents a context of ecofacts and artifacts, but there, there might be just a single deposit like a hoard of coins or something like that, uh, or, or a cache that was left in a specific spot for some reason unknown today, but probably a very meaningful reason. Should archaeologists be uncovering caches and excavating them out? That's up for debate, uh, but that's what helps define archaeological sites, activities that took place in the past, and some of the things that come across on nominations that will come across on your desk. And the most important thing to an archaeologist is context. You take things out of context. When people are, are, are illegally taking artifacts out of sites, when they're illegal moving, illegally moving things around, you've destroyed the meaning, the social meaning, for archaeologists anyway, behind those things. Uh, and so provenience is its location, the matrix is the soil that surrounds artifacts, ecofacts and features that's equally as meaningful and can be analyzed just as, as, as well. Uh, and then the association of those things is what allows us to come up with some interpretation of the things that went on in the past. Uh, so context, we, we talk about context, context, context. And in some cases, that association, we could look to the historical records. We could ask living people. Uh, we could actually go uh, and, and determine that an archaeological deposit of steam <laughs> shells is in and of itself just an archaeological deposit of steam shells, but when you talk about that they were wrapped by people in kelp, uh, that, that it took more than one person to do this, to gather it, then it's a social activity, a fascinating study about what took place in the past. So context is crucial. You can blow it if you, if you take things out of its context. Um, and, and in some cases, you have a, a, like an isolated glass bottle it helped us to determine the age of stratigraphy of a particular deposit, but in and of itself, it's the bottom. We don't know how it got there. It had no association with anything else, and it becomes less meaningful. Like the bottle I'm holding here is meaningful because it's how I'm taking drinks during a talk. But there, left there, it's just the bottle of half-consumed water. Not as meaningful, at least to me, and I hope not to you either. However. There's lots of things that try to destroy archaeological sites. We do it. We bury sites. We dig in sites uh, inadvertently sometimes and you know, very intentionally sometimes, unfortunately. Uh, there's a cultural transformation processes. These things ruin the integrity of the site. That doesn't mean the site's not meaningful. That doesn't mean the site still is not meaningful for people alive today, but it's more difficult to begin to reconstruct those things in an archaeological sense. 
a natural problem. Warfare, and we've heard about you know, what happens during warfare uh, with archaeological sites, or cult natural transformation processes. Um, um, animals that dig in sites and ruin the stratigraphy mess up that context. So this helps us to then link it to, the, to integrity and helps us to ask the question of how much information can we, on an archaeological sense, mind you, how much information can we glean from this archaeological record with the idea that there are cultural and transformation processes constantly at work. Um, how do we find sites? We could use technology uh, like light detection and, and, and ranging systems, remote sensing, pedestrian service, literally walking around and looking for sites, uh, historical documents, sometimes accidentally when we're surveying things. Uh, there's a variety of ways that archaeologists try to look for sites. And, and part of what the business of culture resource management does is to determine whether sites are in a particular area and, and whether or not a particular project or we permitting going to adversely affect these sites. Uh, we use drones in our surveys of Baja, California, uh, not to, to peer into what people are doing in their houses, uh, but to examine some of the archeological sites on a broad area that you can't see from the ground. It's, it's minimal, right? But when you have those aerial perspectives, it gives us a better idea of connecting that site into the broader landscape, which becomes this social, cultural, you know, broad area, not just a single archaeological site. It's important to understand that archaeological sites have a relationship to other archaeological sites and landscapes, traditional cultural properties, for example, that become meaningful in their grand scheme, uh, and to an archaeologist, meaningful in its, in its um, singularity as far as a single site goes as well. We've also used it to document erosion. You can see the differences between that site take uh, of the same site like with a drone picture taken, oh, I don't know, I think it was three months different. There was a king tide and a storm surge. Mm -hmm. And with sea level rise affecting coastal archaeological sites, this is a major issue uh, that archaeologists and people have to take into consideration. And it wiped out a huge chunk of, of the site itself. Uh, and this allowed us, so we used photogrammetry to, to, to sort of determine how much of the site we lost. Um, and you know, some publications on that, but it's uh, using technology uh, to help us. Uh, there are also basic things like picks and shovels and screens and whatnot that are used, things that have been used for 100 years uh, to excavate archaeological sites. And methods, it, it's, it's equally as important to record everything, to photograph everything, to draw everything in place, and to be very careful, not only about what you're doing, but making sure that as you excavate, which is a destructive process, that as you excavate, that you aren't destroying the rest of the site around it. Uh, and so taking careful notes, screening, that's a, what Rebecca's up there, she's using a screen to sift through the materials. Uh, and I, I'm an archeologist that believes in keeping everything. I don't believe in throwing things out, including a lot of the soil. Um, and so we did that. We always do that, or I used to do that when I did more archaeology. Uh, so how do you determine the age of a site? There's relative dating and there's absolute dating. Relative dating will say that, you know, uh, I'm older than you, you're younger than me, but we don't know how old I am relative to you. We just know that if we stand up, yeah, the old man with gray hair is older than the guy sitting next, standing next to him, right? Um, I won't say anyone's older than I am here, um, or even go there. But uh, so that's relative dating. Absolute dating through, through radiocarbon dating, through dendrochronology, or a coin that, that, that you know has a date on it. That might, that might give you an absolute date of when exactly, in the calendar system, a, a site that once existed, or, or when it was deposited, uh, those types. So the difference between relative and absolute dating. Trichography is a relative dating technique. We know we can absolutely use radiometric dating to date these particular layers, but just the law of superposition stating the junk down below, the stuff down below, fossils, uh, the stuff down below is going to be older than the stuff above in general, and that's not always the case. Uh, and so relative dating techniques, uh, stratigraphy is our most powerful one. <laughs> we document stratigraphy, uh, as you can see here in some Shellman's, the, the, the cultural layers left behind, uh, the layers in between when people didn't occupy that particular part of the site. Or in here, you can see the same thing. Uh, when people occupied the site, deposited things, and then areas where 
uh, are times when people weren't there or occupied the site. It's archaeological stratigraphy. And sometimes it's very complex. Uh, and so I spend a lot of time that helps us present the context. And so to me, stratigraphy is very important, but they can get very complex. And there are relationships between pits and parts and the layers between them, above them, the side of them. And we use something called a Harris matrix to document all of that stuff. There's both a profile view, the side view here, as well as a plan view that we have to do because the bird's eye view is as important. It allows us to, to, to especially document the spatial association of things uh, on, on a horizontal sense where the, the vertical stratigraphy allows us to look at it in a vertical sense through time. So through time and across space, you link those two things together and it's a very powerful way of documenting an archeological site. Um, other relative dating techniques uh, are seriation and artifact typology. You can probably see from here, there's two main principles. That in seriation, the, the principles that guide seriation, it's the idea that things become more complex through time, right? And things gr gr think change gradually. Well, probably less complex, and this is only the 2000, which sort of harks back to some of the older cars, but you get an idea that, that if you see a car, because we know this car culture, if you see a car today, oh, there's a 1950s, or look at those fins, it's a 1960s, or and so on and so forth. You know, it's a, that's sort of a general way of seriating things. You could do this using stratigraphy as well. Different pots if you found stratigraphically together, uh, and then you could quantify that, and it's sort of like styles of music or styles of genes. You know, they go in and out of style or in and out of fashion, and you could put these together, they form these battleship-shaped curves, right? Uh, when they were most popular, when they were first started, and when they went out of popularity, and people went on to a different style. Uh, maybe it's a shape, maybe it's a design. This helps us to give us a relative sense when tied to stratigraphy. Even if you find a pot on the surface, you know from excavations of how it was found you know, relative to other pots or styles. Uh, and then artifact typology, here's something with projectile points, arrow points, and, uh, and so on, and sort of you can see it through time. So when you find a particular projectile point, you do know in general, in a relative sense, when uh, people made those and when they were used. Uh, more absolute dating techniques would be like something like great, uh, dendrochronology, um, <clears throat> where you construct these overlapping sequences and match them up. You take the living tree, a dead tree, an old cabin, a ruin, and so on and so forth, and you begin to match up rings uh, that were where, where the trees were grown or grew during the same time periods and had the same type of precipitation. The width of the tree ring itself allows you to create this long master sequence. It goes back, in some cases, 11,000 years, uh, which is a really powerful tool. So if wood is found, uh, you can use it to not only date the site itself or when that, that tree was used, but also you can use it with radiocarbon dating um, to calibrate radiocarbon dates. All living things they have little carbon 12, little carbon 13, little carbon 14. 14 is the key here for radiocarbon dating. Carbon 14, when that organism dies, begins to decay, and we can measure that decay process. However, atmospheric C14 is very few times, so we have to calibrate it to link it to our calendar, that's when we use dendrochronology, because you could go in and date, radiocarbon date each and every ring and see where the offset is. And so our raw radiocarbon ages sometimes will be converted, like radiocarbon years before present, will convert those to calendar years before present, so we link it to our, our Gregorian calendar. So here's an example on San Nicolas Island where I've done a lot of work. And this is what drives us. Uh, the story of the people of San Nicolas Island combining various historical records and archaeological record, a variety of techniques we've used in the archaeological record, and then specifically to, to talk about the lone woman of San Nicolas Island, the, the last native person to live on the island who was documented in a children's uh, novel called Island of the Blue Dolphins. This allows us to sort of begin to construct the story of she was unfortunately given the name Juana Maria and her people using all these different types of techniques. So when we look at San Nicolas Island, it's predominantly made of sandstone. Uh, when we look at some of the artifacts on that island, uh, we can see that there are sandstone grinding stones. So, so a groundstone artifact that you'll find in these nominations is something by pecking and grinding. 
And so you might use it to, to grind down seeds or something like that, uh, which is different from uh, um, uh, chipstone artifacts that are either a hammer stone was, was used or an antler time to pressure flake something out to create like a projectile point. It's the difference between ground stone and flake stone or chipstone artifacts. And on San Nicolas Island, the local sandstone, because not only is it beautiful, but it was very conducive to making things like pestles um, and bowls and mortars. And this contrasts with the local tool stone, like these deposits uh, that we're mapping right here uh, to make flake stone tools. And some of those tools might be bifaces make of local stone, you know, worked on both sides to make points, to make arrow points, uh, to make lancelet points, all various types of things like that. Uh, or contracting stem points, all from the local material, which is very important to know what's constructed locally <coughs> or from materials that are brought in or knives, bifacially worked. Uh, these are incredible. The amount of skill, this is very hard, what's called metavolcanic rock. The amount of skill and understanding of how when you hammer and press to go through something like this, this is, this is mastery. It might not look fine, but I'm telling you, this is because of all those inclusions, very, very difficult to work. Uh, just to, it, it blows me away. It's a big old look at the scale here, you know, you've got some fun in scale. Uh, and, and these are picks that were used uh, for a variety of purposes. You can notice right down here, it's ground and likely used uh, for constructing uh, what we call donut stones um, for net weights and for Dean sticks and things like that. But the imported goods are just as important, these are all from San Nicolas Island, to notch points from uh, pieces that come from the desert, uh, to shirts that were found in the mainland uh, or on the northern channel islands of Southern California, uh, to what we call Malaga leaf points, it sort of describes their shape. You can see the uh, what we, asphaltum, which is the glue that was used on San Nicolas Island to help half uh, those points onto a shaft. Uh, to triangular, what they call cantilino points. Uh, you can see how beautifully made this is. Uh, and there's a quartz one right there that you can see the crack uh, in the middle of it. Just in in incredible craftsmanship. Um, to other types of ground stone artifacts from imported soapstone with beads and pendants. And then the donut stones like I've talked about from local sandstone versus imported soapstone. So one of my favorite artifacts is this button, this fastener, just beautiful. Uh, not only the colors, uh, but you can see where the, you can tie it on and then put it on as a, a better button than I'm wearing today. Uh, to effigies, like here's an ocean sunfish. As far as we know, these were only made on San Nicolas Island. Gives you an idea of what an ocean sunfish looks like. Uh, and these things will float in their masses of, of, of uh, of fish out there, and so they were captured into an effigy by using soapstone, in this case, by using an abalone shell and locally. This is from Ontario Collection in New York, uh, it was excavated many years ago. Uh, it's a soapstone effigy, it's also from a collection uh, where many of the local animals became an important part of their religion, became an important part of their rituals, became an important part of their daily lives, and, and, and documented right there in, in these carvings and etchings. <clears throat> and we use a variety of methods, methods to determine the function and use of artifacts and features. And I'll give you one example. Something that's what we call the sandstone saw was documented in the 1920s. We ended up finding them in the archaeological record. And we found some of them that had white residues you could see circled there. We found them in association, we were a context that associated and becomes meaning, meaningful. We found them in association with different types of fish hooks that were carved out of shell. A metal one here, historic metal one, just to sort of give you an idea. These were very uh, powerful instruments, and by that association, we started to look at it more closely. And so we did replicated studies. We made our own uh, sandstone saws. We began to use them on various materials, and we found out that when we used them with shell, it left the same types of markings. Uh, and so we made fish hooks with them, and we came up with the manufacturing sequence that matched what we found in the archaeological record that we mapped out with the uh, you know, through context and association. And then, of course, we put them through SCM scan electron microscopy, and we found out, indeed, that white, that white residue is made of calcite and aragonite, the exact mixtures of abalone. 
And so it allows us to take an analytical viewpoint of it, to take an experimental viewpoint of it, to look at the archaeological record through analyzing the statistics of their association to say, hey, sandstone saws were used to make bishops. So something that, that, that seemingly is not that significant became a very powerfully significant artifact. Other things are five-pointed fish gorges made of bone. Um, now the beaches basically were packed with money uh, or with the, the, the product that you could turn into to wonderful beads uh, with local tool stones that were made into drills or imported stone that were made into fancier drills. And these were made to carve out beads. Here, these are all the Bellevue rectangle beads that are quite different from a variety of other beads that we found in different archaeological sites. Uh, and there's a classification system that we use. Uh, but again, it's bringing different artifacts together in a meaningful way to determine their function, how they're related to one another. To other shell beads and ornaments, this is, a, is an abalone pearl, and you can see it was uh, carved out so it could be used as a pendant or an earring or something on a skirt. Uh, drift asphaltum uh, comes on shore, so that's the glue that people use, and com combining with kelp and seagrass and bird bone awls, to make baskets. Now it's difficult to find a basket preserved, but you could find a negative impression because asphaltum, or that, that the, the, the glue basically was used as a coating to make it watertight. And the negative impression is there, so you can study and analyze that. And we find lots of abalone containers that contain this asphaltum. The asphaltum is processed. Uh, everybody needs a type of glue. And other artifacts not from San Nicolas Island, but they're wooden artifacts. Their textiles, these are the, those seagrass quarries that's from Daisy Cave and then from Cave of Chimneys on San Miguel Island. Uh, and then, of course, wonderful baskets, woven baskets, pottery and ceramics, structures, including boats and houses and the remnants of structures, and composite artifacts when you put various things together to make more complex artifacts, like, for example, a bow from an arrow. And then, of course, we have metal artifacts and glass artifacts, and all of these things will come across in nominations, uh, and so just wanted to present some of that here. Interpreting the archaeological record, uh, food procurement, you can look at the artifacts themselves, you can quantify the eco-facts, uh, you can do experimental archaeology, you can ask people, uh, you can do a landscape study for agricultural fields, you can look at buried canals where water was diverted from water systems, and how we study cooking and serving by looking at the vessels themselves, uh, by inferring the different methods, by asking people, by looking at the historical record. This place is a sort of a, an interpretive context that allows us to say more things. Or trade and exchange. People are always wanting things from other areas like we do today. And so the trade and exchange and the flow of goods, this is an example uh, from the Hopewell area where all these different areas that come from different regions of North America. Just like on San Nicolas Island, imported materials uh, were incorporated into what people did. And then, of course, analytical techniques, variety, I won't get into this, but we'll use a variety of isotope techniques to say, to say something about where things are from, what, how they were used, what they're made of. Um, these are analytical te techniques today. But do know that all of this comes about because of teamwork. Teamwork of people working together to help reconstruct the past and ultimately to write up nominations uh, that come across our desk that we determine whether or not they're eligible for inclusion on the National Register. And that's all, folks. <laughs>
commissioners who aren't um, affiliated with given subject matter areas so that they could be better commissioners, so that they could look at these nominations that we receive and have a better understanding about how to read them and what to do with the information that they contain. And uh, we've done a number, or at least this is the second one, and Alan did the first one, and we can't talk that either because he's a wealth of information. Um, but what I'm going to try and do is pick up where Renee left off. So this is more of the process and more of how we look at the archaeological information that Renee found and then how it's transmitted via a nomination and what you look at in the nomination to get an idea about whether the nomination has enough information to say that certain criteria of the National Register are met whether the resource has integrity and so forth. So I'll have way less pictures, way more words, but it'll be much shorter. So we have that going for us. <laughs> um, OK. All right, so what I'm going to try and cover today is uh, confidentiality, site confidentiality, because a lot of what we're talking about is archaeology that is not allowed to be disseminated to the general public, and we'll talk about why that is. Um, I'm going to give you some information on the regulatory context of why archaeology is dealt with outside of the academic arena, um, how resources are mapped, uh, what we do with those mapped resources. When it finally gets into a nomination form, how do you read that? What do you look at? Because and I'm going to hit this topic more than once. If it's Native American in origin, we're talking about archaeological resources that are more or less interpreted and occupied and have association with tribal members that really are the only people who are qualified to tell us that these resources are significant because they're significant to them. We might be able to read about them. We might be able to understand what was done there by those ancestors in the past. But we're really in no position to tell the tribe that their significance or their association with a given place is either right or wrong. Um, when we get to nomination criteria, historically we've taken a very conventional approach, uh, approach to the National Register. There's four criteria, A, B, C, and D. We'll talk about those and what those mean. But when it comes to archaeological resources and when it comes to determining how eligibility criteria is applied. It's a different process when you have archaeology. And then some criteria perspectives. What we want to look at moving forward as commissioners when we have these types of resources in front of us. So first of all, confidentiality. There, there are laws, tons of laws, that talk about why you can't put this information out for the general public. It's excluded from the Freedom of Information Act. It is covered in California Government Code Executive Order, the National Historic Preservation Act, the Archaeological Resources Preservation Act, non-disclosure agreements, and the California Historical Resources Information System Agreements, Section 5A and B, which I'm sure we're all very familiar with. But <laughs> <laughs> My point is that there's a lot of laws and regulations that really do address why we can't circulate this information publicly, and a lot of that is because a lot of the incredible artifacts that Renee shared with us are valuable. They're valuable on a black market perspective. They're valuable to tribal representatives. They're valuable to people because they're shiny and bright and pretty, but they also have a whole different function, which Renee talked about. So what do we do when that information is out there and people want to take it and say, this is for me and I get to go and look at this stuff and who are you to tell me I can't? Well, the best way for us to do that is to keep the location of archaeological resources private. It's confidential. And this long list of reasons why is pretty much telling everybody, when this happens, you're not allowed. Um, there are a number of civil penalties under the Archaeological Resources Protection Act for knowingly disturbing archaeological resources. You can see I think it's up to 10 years in prison and a $50,000 fine, depending on the type of violation. Those are civil penalties, and um, criminal penalties can also be applied. So we try to keep this stuff private. I think I've explained why. If you have more questions about that, and people always do, why can't you just show me where it is? Why can't you just give me the map? Then that's where we get to take the next conversation, which is, here's why. So, the Office of Historic Preservation and the California Historical Resources Information System 
There are nine information centers throughout the state. So OHP and those nine CRISP centers essentially are responsible for how these archaeological resources are housed, the governance and oversight of who gets to go in and see them, and widely for people to understand who access the Chris Center that designating an archaeological site sensitive and, and keeping it, sorry, this is gonna help if I can actually see what I'm writing, um, and not disclosing archaeological information to unauthorized individuals, including the public, um, is covered under California code. So these paragraphs right here are associated or included in any type of California Historical Resource Information System uh, output. So when somebody requests what's called a record search, where you have to go in and see where are the archeological sites so I can avoid impacting them, the results of that study come with this language. So it's part of the industry. And when I say industry, I mean cultural resources management. And there's a distinction between archeology span and cultural resources management. Uh, I'm the archaeology manager for the Southern California Edison Company, and we have 50,000 square miles of service territory where you have thousands upon thousands of archaeological sites, and we try to avoid all of those sites when doing our work. And so the industry of cultural resources management is doing management of cultural resources so you don't have to do archaeology. We don't want to impact these resources. We don't want to dig up human remains. We don't want to bring this information to the public. Renee and his colleagues do an incredible job doing that for us and sharing that information in the proper way. What we're going to try and do is use the Chris Center and use these confidentiality tools to avoid impacting archaeology because it's all out there, but at the same time, Based on all the laws and regulations, we don't need to impact them while also ensuring that there's wildfire protection or that infrastructure is up to date. All of those things are part of cultural resources management. Site protection. So there are federal and state laws and regulations that protect archaeology. Because of all of these various laws and regulations, there are a lot fewer nominations that come to the commission that are archaeological in nature. When I first started on the commission, I grabbed Jay and I'm like, send me everything. How many archaeological nominations are there? I need to read everything. I need to understand how the criteria applied, what's been done in the past. And correct me if I'm wrong, it was about one a year, if that. So, and he's shaking his um, So it, it, it was difficult in that, you know, there's a reason why. Number one, there's no real nexus or, or, or requirement to put archaeological resources on the National Register, especially tribal resources, unless there's something going on. And I say that because there are all these laws and regulations that are already out there protecting those resources. And for a lot of us who understand how the National Register works, even on the National Register, your property isn't protected. It guarantees a process. It says that you have to take these steps under these laws and regulations to determine the potential effect or impact. And that's all NHPA stuff, and, and I'm not going to get into the gory details, but what I'm trying to say is that there's a lot of archaeology laws and regulations that don't require a nomination to be created. It would have to be done under certain mitigation requirements or in collaboration with tribes as part of an agreement or collaboration to do something for them. They want to share the information. They feel like there's a little bit of compromise that they can give. And as a result, they want to be able to tell the story that we should be hearing. So what happens after Rene finds all the archaeology? What happens after we map everything? And it goes to that Chris Information Center and qualified individuals who meet the Secretary of Interior standards and guidelines for archaeology sign a form and say, I'm not going to tell anybody about this stuff, but I need to go in there because I have a project. I'm building a building, or I'm putting up a cellular antenna or I am putting a substation in, or I'm in the desert and we have a renewable energy mandate from the governor and we're building solar and wind across 800,000 acres of the land use plan amendment under the BLM. Something like that, right? So what do we do? Okay, well, where's your project? That's my project. It's a star on a map. And now I'm gonna send an archeologist or I'm gonna go to one of these information centers and I'm gonna find out what's going on out there. 
Part of your due diligence under all those laws and regulations is to find out where the archaeology is inside your project area and then work with your project team and avoid it. I want to go away from there. I want to put measures on the ground to make sure that our ground disturbance doesn't impact the archaeology. We want to preserve it. We don't want to dig it up. So what happens now? Well, I take that in and I put a big circle around it and I go to the information center and I say, okay, and I made these so these aren't real sites, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, there are sites inside my study area. What do we do now? Well, we have to figure out what those sites are, what the nature and context is of those sites, and then cross-reference it with a project. Cross-reference it with what type of disturbance might be going on out there that would jeopardize that site's integrity, that would, if you treated it as a National Register eligible, jeopardize the criteria that make it eligible, or the contributing elements, those characteristics of that site that make it historically significant. And that's what the cultural resources management piece that happens after the archaeology piece is. It's determining what type of resources we have there and trying to manage them accordingly. So, when I received a lot of those nominations, and they weren't a lot, from, from Jay, I was able to look at all of them and break them down and try to get an understanding. <laughs> Is there a pattern in the chaos? Is there a way that the criteria have been applied to archaeological nominations such that it's an easy thing to understand? It's like, oh, well, nobody looks up criterion A because it's events, and, you know, this isn't Washington, D.C., and it's not criterion B, which is people and Washington didn't sleep there, or something like that. It's a very conventional way of looking at the National Register. When you start to look at archaeology, you have interpretation. You have uh, a departure from those conventional ways of applying criteria. And it's one of those things where, after looking at the archaeological nominations, the pattern is that there is no pattern, and that's okay too, because while there are National Register bulletins that talk about how to apply the criteria, it's not the Bible, depending on what religion you have, it's just, it's guidelines from start to finish, it's guidelines, it's telling you here's how the fundamental aspects of the National Register works, here's how they would be applied if you had an archaeological site, have at it. And then it's up to the nominator and the tribes, for example, to come up with whether that applies. And again, we can't really say it does or doesn't, so the tribe drives, uh, drives that process. So when we look at Tishanik, and I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, there's an area of significance which is ethnic heritage and Native American. The period of significance is prehistoric to present. And the period of significance is an interesting uh, component of a National Register nomination because for archaeological nominations, this changes wildly and in a great way because time is a Western concept. It's something where we say, when were you there and were you significant while you were there? But the tribe doesn't have to look at it that way and that's okay. So we can say prehistoric to present, but what is present? Is it still significant tomorrow? Because tomorrow is the present. So how do we look at that? And the answer is we look at it whatever way it's depicted. What I'm trying to say is there's no wrong answer. There are better answers than others, but there's no wrong answer. And it's eligible for the National Register of Historic Places and Criterion A at the local level for its association with events that made significant contribution to the broad patterns of Northern California Native American history. Ceremonial focal points. So these are events that <coughs> happened that the tribe felt were significant to them. And so that falls under Criterion A other events or other properties that we've seen come to us on a National Register nomination or Criterion A aren't these. They're events in local history, more recent history. And so it's an interesting comparative analysis looking at events from a tribal perspective and then looking at events from a historic perspective. And we've got Patsyata. Four criteria, all four. So they shot the moon on this one, and it's good because it all applies. There is so much that happened with this nomination that an argument, not even an argument, but just a description of the events and the important people and the craftsmanship of masters, the Native American art that exists in this district, 
and then criterion DD information potential, all of it applied. And it's based on the tribe's perspective of each of those criteria. So it's the Owens Lake people, place of spiritual importance, and important to place of gathering materials. It's a traditional cultural property. Um, and it's for the indigenous people. It's not for us. But they decided to adopt this process and manipulate it and turn it into something for them. Now, there was a trigger that allowed them to work with uh, people who were doing work out in the Owens Lake, and that's where the nomination came from. It was part of the project. It's part of that cultural resource management I was talking about. It's not an academic pursuit. But what the tribal consortium who helped with this nomination did was that they took the National Register criteria and the process, and they turned it into theirs, which I thought was a, just a very cool way of taking something that could be offensive to certain tribal representatives and, and owned it. They made it theirs and they said, we want to tell this story about what happened out there and we want to describe it in a way that your framework can break it down for. So when we read this, I mean, it was an incredibly powerful nomination and talked about a lot of very sensitive things. And uh, you know, we were appreciative that the tribe was willing to share that type of story with us. The Pearl site. Criterion D. Typically, Criterion D is the criteria that, or the criterion you would apply to archaeological resources. It's information potential. Most of that information is subsurface. It's buried deposits. That's what happens when Rene excavates an archaeological site. He sees the information that comes up because it's been buried over time through all sorts of depositional events and everything else that he had described that explains why archaeology has to happen the way that those field methods that he employs on the ground happens. So you can't necessarily see the significance of an archaeological site on the surface. You've got to look below the surface, and that's where information potential comes in. The period of significance, Middle Holocene, Late Holocene, the cultural affiliation is prehistoric Native American. So these change. It's never one thing. That's that pattern in the chaos, that there is no pattern, but there's kind of a a set list that you can expect, perhaps, that says, wow, my period of significance is the time according to the tribe. And that's OK. Bear Harbor Historical and Archaeological District, Criterion A and D. So we have events, and we have information potential. We have archaeology, but it's different because it's now Euro-American archaeology. So this is historic archaeology. There's still confidentiality rules attached to that because you could still dig up things that are historic and not quote unquote prehistoric and, and find a value for them somewhere. But as a property type associated with the dog hole ports tra transportation network, um, archaeology isn't just tribal resources, it's historical resources as well. So when the archaeological nominations come to us, that distinction is made. And then we also have to look at, well, what criteria do the historical archaeological components of that property meet? And is there significance with them? And is there integrity? Um, again, period of significance. This is not Native American, so you can see this is more recent. And that's where we have the National Register. That's where we have the criteria that lists all four that talk about, again, the traditional way of addressing what I would consider to be a museum, a library, a building where we have a lot of built environment on the National Register. There's a lot of architecture and the way that some of these commissioners can read these nominations and explain not only to the public but to myself sitting there, it's, it's fabulous. Um, it's just an incredible group of dedicated professionals who look at these and, and can tell you why it's significant and can agree with that nomination. And so when we look at those criteria and then say, well, what do we do when there's Native American resources? Can we take the same experts and apply the same perspective? To a certain extent, yes, but to a certain extent, no. We have two archaeologists on the commission. They both understand how cultural resources management and how archaeology works. But then I've seen Renee and I kind of step back and let the, the nomination almost speak for itself. The tribe has chosen to share this information with us. We're privileged to hear about it, but we're not, we're not in a position to say it's right, wrong, or indifferent. And by the time it gets to our desk, it's pretty polished. We have 
a registration unit at OHP that does an incredible job putting these nominations together. So by the time we get it, it is an academic level paper. And uh, it's, a, it's a really great read. So let's talk about the significance perspectives. The basis for judging a property's significance and ultimately its eligibility is the historic context. It's what Renee was talking about. What was going on there? What is the context that makes that location or that event or, or that style of architecture significant? So we evaluate it with all of these capacities. And when you talk about Native American resources, it doesn't have to be tangible. And by that I mean, we've been talking about artifacts, and we've been talking about things that we pull from the ground or on the surface. And uh, when we see those things, it's incredible. But what about those things that we can't see? What about those things that our eyes are not trained to see but only a tribal representative can? Those are the intangibles. Those are traditional cultural properties that represent history from song and ethnography and stories. Cultural landscapes that might not have archaeology right there on the surface, but the mountain range or the trees or the meadow or even the valley, the, the landscape itself, which some might not consider a cultural resource, doesn't have to be a cultural resource in, in the Western sense, in the traditional sense. It's still a resource and significant to tribes, and as a result, we have to look at it that way. So intangible resources are really interesting from a cultural resources management perspective because an archaeologist isn't going to go out there and say, before you build your wind farm, I see something there that might be, I see something there that might be, and something there that might be. So part of the process from a cultural resource management perspective is engaging tribes really early in this entire process and saying, what you're willing to tell us, we need to hear so that we can understand what's going on out there. Because our eyes aren't trained to see what you see, and as a result, we are really interested in making sure that whatever project we're trying to do has the ability to avoid, minimize, or at the last step, mitigate the potential impacts that a project may have on an intangible resource. So, um, tribal cultural resources, traditional cultural properties, sacred sites, all of these can be classified as intangible, but yet they're there. And so you work with tribes who are affiliated, ethnographically affiliated to the area you're working in, and you talk to them about it. And sometimes there's more than one tribe, and sometimes they have different perspectives, or different opinions, or get along, or don't get along, or are relatives and get along, or relatives and don't get along. So there's a lot of ways about it, and give yourself enough time, understand what it takes to do proper consultation and a good faith effort, but at the same time, make sure that that piece is part of what you do. And is the end result a National Register nomination? Sure, it can be, if that's where it goes. Otherwise, maybe we just leave it be. And that's okay, too. <coughs> so, criteria A, events. As we talked about with the kind of comparative analysis of the different nominations, we have events that may have taken place in a given area. There might not be evidence of it, there might not be an ethnobotanical gathering area on a map with a big circle that says, this is where we go and get our yucca. It might just be a place, but that place has been documented through story, song, or anything else that the tribe uses to capture their history. So we use A instead of historic events to represent prehistoric events. And we take that National Register criteria and we kind of manipulate it. Same with B. Who are the people? Who are the people who are significant? Can we talk to them? Can we interpret and collaborate to understand and bridge that gap between what we feel are significant people in history and what the tribe considers significant people in history? You don't have to do something important to be considered significant, and important is a very loaded term. So this is part of the consultation process. It's part of working with tribes and understanding what's important to them. And I go back to the thing I said at the very beginning. It's very difficult for someone to tell the tribes that what they're saying isn't accurate or isn't correct. We could differ and we could argue and, and that's okay. That's part of it all. But at the end of the day, it would be disadvantageous for somebody to say, what you're saying is important isn't to me. 
it's, it's, a, it's a bit disrespectful, but at the same time, the process isn't built to package all of this stuff well. So is that disrespectful also? No, it's just a process. But we use it, and we change it, and we make it work. I like using this one as an example for how we deal with tribal resources, because the work of a master, the class of resources, the individuals, wait, no, I won't read that. The criteria plus the property significance of their physical design or construction. So when you think about that, I think about all the nominations I've read on the description of windows and doors and pillars, and it's just, it's, it's a tons and tons of descriptive paragraphs on architecture, and it's great. I, you know, I contacted Commissioner Hoyos and said, what books do I need to read to learn about architecture? Because this stuff is just blowing my mind. There's so much information out there. But then, what do you think a work of a master would be in a tribal perspective? Is it rock art? Is it pictographs? Is it petroglyphs? Is it the workmanship of a certain type of fluted point? Is it the way you have to heat certain rock in order to chip it a certain way so it doesn't fracture down the middle? Is it a way you chip that obsidian to turn it into something that's sharper than a surgeon's scalpel? Isn't that art also? And can we take the same criteria and apply it in that way? So when you have rock art, when you have art that might not be tangible, and you look at Criterion C and you ask yourself, is it only just those built environment features that I've been reading about? No, it's all these other things. And you saw that come out in the Pat Siong nomination. And you can see that coming out in future nominations as nominators are looking to change the approach even more and talk about tribal art. And art can be song, art can be dance, art can be a number of different things. So do we break the mold on the National Register criteria a bit and kind of squeeze ourselves around the outside or go through the back door or whatever it is? Of course, why not? And then lastly, I guess, the, the traditional approach is Criterion D. Information potential. It's an archaeological site. It has information potential. Move on. Well, no, there's more than that. So. When I spoke on Katsiata, I talked about all three criteria and stopped at D out of kind of a, a symbolic gesture. Because we don't need to talk about information potential. It's there, and that's a good thing, right? I think from the other three criteria, those are the ones that aren't more commonly used for archaeological nominations, and I'm encouraged to see that we're seeing that more, and uh, I'm excited to see what happens in the next couple of years as people start to break out of that mold, like I was saying. So, how does this all relate to being a commissioner in California? Well, California is special. There's no reason, there's nothing I can tell you that you don't already know. Uh, this commission does incredible work. The archeology span nominations that we read are changing, and we've seen that happen over time. They're getting uh, more detailed, they're using more of the process more of the criteria they're talking about the integrity more than they did before and this means a lot of great future nominations will hopefully come in and and show us that people aren't looking at these things the way they used to and they're really taking a different perspective which is kind of what I wanted to leave you with is that it's all about the perspective the tribal perspective for archaeology and that's the next step after the archaeology is done is what do you do with that process now um, that's all I've got today, so thank you very much. Um, we have a third speaker, and uh, Greg, I didn't really set you up other than kind of give you a breakdown of what we were going to try and do. Okay. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Greg Castro. He's uh, agreed to talk with us today about tribal perspectives, which is the third component of our talk in this very warm room. So, thank you again. bigger step down technology-wise because I have nothing for you. <laughs> this, uh, this electronic device is for me, actually. Uh, just going to have to move in here.
Prishaktuhi, Shamasakish Mishistu, Tisep Tashai, Great Castro Tas, Totra Hek, Wimson Hek, Ramatush Hek, Takapaksom Leam Kupla Hek, Tukutnud Timika, Ek Benjamin Castro, Selenin Taso, Ipach. Adeline Castro, Maloney Tasso. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me. My name is Greg Castro. I am Tultral Slinen, Ramson, and Ramatush Loney, and I am the culture director for the Association Ramatush Loney, who are the original people of the San Francisco Peninsula, and we used to call this place Yalamo, and we still do. It's only just in recent times, I mean like yesterday to us, maybe a little bit longer for you, that you guys call it San Francisco. Um, as you can see, I have a wonderful presentation. <laughs> and it's gonna, so I'm going to stop right there. So for that. Um, th thank you for having me here today. And um, I don't have much of a formal plan, but uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to share tribal values. And, and Renee and, and Adam, kind of were sliding that way. And uh, I'm gonna take it a little bit further. Um, I'm looking at my notes. <laughs> I think one of the things I, that was interesting that uh, I said today in the opening uh, for the conference this morning is the idea of translating values. And one of the issues that tribal people have that I've learned in my time uh, of various perspectives is the idea of English is the problem for us. Um, some of the terms that were used in the two previous presentations are challenging for us as Native people. And uh, because we just don't see things the same way. So I think one of the things that many people are becoming more comfortable talking about is just talking about that value itself. Your viewpoint from a Euro American scientific modern sense is very different than most kind of people, especially my elders, who always are questioning why are you hanging out with those people, why are you talking to those people, why are you working with those people? Because they don't understand us. That's the view. That's what we do. And so some of us who decide to engage in this work um, kind of have to interpret and go back and forth and engage our culture bearers, our elders, our knowledge keepers, with the outside world, with the perspectives of, of the professions that we have to deal with who are now in charge of and have a legal authority in the modern sense of dealing with our very important sites. So, and I think it's important to, to remember, for those who don't, um, especially modern students of archeology span in particular, that there's a history here that goes along with your American colonialism, that archeology, span especially in California, has a very challenging history for Native people. And it's not that old, especially in the in the in the tribal perspective. It it has, uh, as I said, when I even nowadays I'm still being asked by some elders like, why are you talking to those people? And my response is usually respectfully to them, because they are dealing with our important sites, and it's as simple as that. But I hear their pain. I hear their their anguish. I hear the history inherent in that expression, because the truth is here, especially in California that I'm familiar with, um, that archeology, span cultural resource management, anthropology has a very challenging history for Native people. And although it's certainly a lot better, it, it's, the head mass is still there, and it's embedded in the structure of what you deal with. And a lot of what the Renee and Adam are talking about, very important information that we as Native people 
those of us who deal with CRM need to know about, and yet embedded in that is those different viewpoints, different expressions, different perspectives. And that leads, and has led in the recent past, to a different way of treating these very important sites to tribal people. So let me give you a little bit of the history of how I got into this, and it was sort of by accident. Um, in the early 1990s, I was on the formation of the most the modern tribal council from our father's tribe, the Saloon people. And uh, we hadn't had a tribal council, and of course, modern tribal councils, many of them are not traditional per se, but more a modern reflection of modern society. Um, but on that tribal council, I was one of the youngest, and uh, most of the people on tribal council were still living in our tribal homeland, which is Monterey and San Luis Obispo County, parts of Kern County. And I lived by then by San Jose. My father had moved out of the homeland, uh, served in World War II. When he came back, he had work around the state and eventually settled in San Jose, where he raised his family with my mother, and a, a, a lonely woman in parts of her homeland still. Um, and in that context, uh, I grew up in San Jose, grew up in orchards, lived in an orchard, Walnut Orchard, and grew up tending the orchards when they were there, and gradually saw them go away, to, and gradually transition into the Silicon Valley, that I call it now. And I actually worked still there the last almost 50 years uh, in a tech job. So I've seen those two perspectives, and I've, I don't know if I, you know, I, I've had the opportunity to learn how to bridge that. I don't know how well that's gone. <laughs> According to my elders, not so good, uh, but um, at least I've seen that transition and, and were able, was able to adapt. And I think that's the theme here, that Native people have adapted. They have taken on these skill sets that we've had to learn, modern skill sets, and applied them to this modern world in a way that isn't by our choice, but it gets to job done, hopefully. So in the process of of the uh, commission's work and in the nomination process and in the protection process. Uh, for our perspective, up until recently and still today, is it gets the job done, right? It protects a site. Hopefully it, a site doesn't get destroyed and it maintains some of its integrity intact. At least the integrity for the values that we consider and if other values get, that other people consider important get protected in that process, that's cool too. But we sort of have a sort of a bottom line for us in terms of what we want to accomplish as tribal people. And we use these tools, and for us they're tools. So it's important to understand that. We can acquire skills on with a hammer and a saw and a screwdriver, which didn't exist for us in the old days. Our uh, knowledge bearers and our skilled craftsmen use completely different tools. But they're tools. We can adopt modern tools. My cousin, Linda Yamani, is a basket weaver, and she learned how to use the tools of the trade as taught to her by other knowledge bearers, like bone house, right? And as soon as she developed skill there, she went to surgical steel, because it lasts longer and it's sharper, and it does, gets the job done better longer. So it's a tool. And in a way, the things we've learned about cultural resource management and archaeology and the other processes of anthropology and ethnic history are tools that we've acquired that gets jumped at. Well, what about the native perspective? If you look at a long history, and, and I've been doing this for over 30 years, and I got sucked into to it accidentally by my tribal council because nobody else wanted to do it. And literally, elders on the tri you know, tribal council would say, uh, I don't do meetings, I don't do speeches, I don't read those textbooks. Oh, get the kid from city to do that. He likes that kind of stuff. And that's literally how I got involved. And I got sucked in by an archaeologist who uh, 
um, some of you know, Janet Eisenhuis, who is doing work at Fort Leggett, which is in my father's tribal homeland in Monterey County. It's, uh, at the time, over 300,000 acres, and it is just literally has thousands of our tribal cultural places. And years ago, there was a federal mandate, which many places ignored, but Fort Leggett did not, to do a, a, a historic resource inventory. So Biosystems Analysis at the time got the contract to do this inventory, which lasted years because there were thousands of sites. And part of that process, Janet and uh, Tom Jackson and others from Biosystems Analysis engaged the tribal people. We were just starting to organize and we were focused on other things. And all of a sudden, here's archeologists, you know, can we talk to you? <coughs> Again? Some of our people had had experience, not always great, with archaeologists in the past. Just uh, a few decades before that, we had had a huge fight within the National Forest Service right next door to Lincoln to protect our origin site, the most sacred site we have, what we call Statyokale, which later became San Lucia Peak, the tallest mountain in the San Lucia Range. And it's our origin place. And over the years, they've had all kinds of schemes about what to do with it because they couldn't leave it alone. And the latest one was to put an observatory on it. And so we did engage with some uh, local archaeologists and historians that assisted us in fighting that. And I can say, at least the last time I looked, there's still not an observatory on there. So this was a collaboration that was fruitful for us. It protected one of our most important sites. But the fact that it even got proposed, because it was well known the value to the local people of that place. And in spite of that, they wanted to do something to it. It wasn't good enough just by itself. It had already had a, a decades old fire lookout station on it that we were trying to get them to take it off. And they eventually did. And as soon as that came down, then they wanted to put something else in this place. It's like, what, didn't you like hear us before? So it's like, yeah, but we took care of that. But now we need it, like, it's a really good place to you know, watch stars from. So this process has been very challenging for us when we, it, it doesn't seem coherent, to use a modern English term. It doesn't seem respectful. Because it's the place, that it's not what's put on it, it's the fact that the place shouldn't have anything on it. When we went there, our culture bearers, our spiritual leaders went up to the mountain to do ceremony. They went there and they came back and they brought everything they took up there back with them. They did not leave anything there. The integrity, to use that modern preservation term, of the mountain told us that it, it is good enough on, of itself. It doesn't need us to add anything. So whatever we take up there, whether it's not used trash or even not, we bring back. So sometimes that's a significant issue because in some of our sacred places, we are taught not to disturb it. So then when somebody goes there and wants to do something with it, put a house, put a building, bulldoze it, put a rope, whatever it is, it's like, wait a minute, that's really important. So, well, I don't see anything of importance. It's like, we see everything of importance. There's trees, there's rocks, there's a meadow, there's these, all, that's what's important to us. So, this, this different values have become critical over the years, and we as tribal people have had to slowly in some cases, we reluctantly try to engage in this system with these tools in order to serve the purpose of protecting these sites. <coughs> so we apply the tools. Some have become skilled. And as we're seeing now, some of our people I don't know if they were reluctant or not, but have become archaeologists. I am not an archaeologist, but I've been hanging out with archaeologists for over 30 years. I'm a member of the Society for Ar California Archaeology. Uh, Janet dragged me into that. And I, as, as part of the Native American Programs Committee, 
of which all of a sudden they all left and I get left holding the bag, so I'm out of the chair. <laughs> um, and when I first started going, um, I was not the first native to ever go to an SEA conference, but I was one of the first that decided for some reason to stay, to keep coming back. Even though I was getting those questions from elders, from our people, but also outsiders saying, why are you going to the SCA? Why are you dealing with these people? Back in the day, when it was much smaller than it is now. And I went to all these panels, and I went to all these papers, and 80% or more was about our tribal values, our tribal sites. And there was no natives from that place or anywhere others in the room. And that didn't seem right to me. I felt it, I was put in this position, accidentally, reluctantly, but I was put in this position where I felt like I had to at least be in the room to hear what was going on and then take that back. And that's what started my journey in the SCA. So I can be any about acronyms, not the best of them. Sometimes I actually know what they mean. Uh, TCP, I did learn early enough. Um, CRM is another one. Um, And what helped, I think, is, is my learning as I came up in San Jose and getting involved with technology. Because you know, obviously the orchards were going away for a reason, because they were building buildings to establish technology companies. When I was in high school, um, way back in the 70s, it, it was, this is before Apple, right? So I learned, I did learn programming on a uh, three, using three-digit octocode on what they called a programmable uh, calculator. It was about the size of this, much bigger, thicker, and to do anything like this, didn't have a screen. Had a little printout like you see, get, you would get receipts at the store store. That's how I started with programming. And it was a tool I learned to use and progressed from. Uh, went for one year to the university and learned basic, algo, Fortran, those are probably foreign to you. We don't use them for anymore. Although actually, I heard that there's an agency back east that uses Fortran in their DMV uh, system, <laughs> which then crashed and nobody knew how to fix it because nobody knew Fortran anymore. Yeah, yeah, you know, the Chris system, right? <laughs> so, one of the things that was important for me to convey to both to, to my tribal people and to the archaeological perspective, because the conversation in the early 90s was still in its growing stages. There were certainly people within uh, the archaeology profession that helped me and had some understanding uh, of, of tribal values, had worked with tribes, Janet, Ron Edwards, Shirley Davis King, uh, many others, uh, well I shouldn't say many others, there were a few others, that could explain it, but I felt it was from, as I was learning tribal values at a deeper level with elders from across the state, to convey those to uh, the profession. And one of those is this difference between how we view things, and it was important for me as uh, being in, involved with technology that I could understand this that modern science likes to make thing, break things down into its lowest discrete value. That's what it does, right? Atom smashers. You know, bombard those atoms with uh, energy beams to break it apart and get those electrons, protons, and neutrons flying out and then, oh wait a minute, what's that? And that's another particle. Now they know that there's hundreds of particles there, break those down, you know, get it all the way down to the quark level. And then you focus and obsessively focus on that quark. And if you figure out that quark, then you got it. You understand the universe because you've been staring at that quark. That's our, that's our tribal perspective. It's like, why are you looking at that when that atom is making something bigger? And if you get up high enough where it's integrated, connected, the way we view the universe, then you see something of value, something of beauty. Yes, we know there are those things that are part of it, but it's the coming together of those parts that make it special for us. 
that make it beautiful for us, that make it, gives it its spiritual value to us. So then, how do we convey that? Well, up until lately, and even now, most of the time we don't. We don't bother. Because bridging that gap, especially with English as the big barrier, is, is pretty, pretty challenging for us. But as time has gone on, in my experience within the SCA and profession, um, more Native people are showing up. And there were times where I was the only Native person that I knew of that it cho chose to identify themselves in the entire SEA conference. Not just in the room, in the entire conference. Now, it, the last you know, 10 years has radically changed. We're getting a lot more Native people. Now we're getting actual official tribal representation. This year, the Tempos, Tribal Historic Preservation Officers, had a meeting at the SEA conference and came and did a presentation at the uh, executive board where one of the members of the board is a Tempo, uh, Patty Garcia from Agua Caliente, and wants to have a formal relationship with the SCA to further our mutual goals of preservation. So times are changing. <coughs> We are slowly changing, and we're learning to use those tools in a more skillful way, in a more important way, and engage more on your level. And I think what's happening slowly is some of your profession are starting to understand at least the perspective that we have as tribal people. You don't have to believe it, but understanding it is significant. I remember years ago, Terry Jones, a good friend of mine, uh, came and did a presentation on the Sydney Tribal Council. And uh, hopefully you won't mind telling the story. Um, it, it's really a good story because, you know, Terry is a good friend of the tribe and of me. And he has a very more traditional outlook on archaeology. But he's also very respectful. So he came and we did a presentation for him first. We talked about our origin stories. And Terry has done a lot of archaeological studies within our area, so he's familiar with our tribal history and our cultural resources within our area. We told him our origin stories, our original instructions. Even if he knew them, it was important to state them as part of the process of building that relationship and renewing it. It's traditional for our people to tell stories again and again and again because we know you, just like if you've ever looked at a data collection for a site as an archaeologist, you could look at that a hundred times and the hundred first time you're going, wait a minute, I didn't see that before. Maybe it's a nuanced understanding. Maybe it's a new test you did. Maybe you just didn't see it before. And our stories are the same way. We tell our stories and you hear it every year. That elder's telling the same story. <laughs> and you get to be a teenager and then you get to adult, but they make you still go in the roundhouse and hear the same story. And now you're 40, 50 years old, you have kids, maybe grandkids, and all of a sudden you're making your grandkids go because they made you go. But now all of a sudden, wait a minute, that story. Did he say it different? Did he change it? No. You changed it. You're hearing it different. <clears throat> That's why I see the, this profession of CRM, as we call it, is becoming more nuanced, changing, developing, growing, understanding, and reaching out to tribal people to get their understanding and incorporating it into the thing. That is crucial for us. For us, it's all about relationship. We don't see things as discrete sites. We can bandy about trinomials all day long, and I've done that. Because that's your language. It's not ours. Right? No, this is the occupation site. And we're thinking of the thousands of years, possibly, 
our ancestors had been living there, working there, growing there, crossing over there, growing families, creating culture, continuing heritage, and sharing love. Those are all incredibly important values to us that are embedded in those discrete elements that you call a cultural self. It's a living thing to us. And our ancestors are still there. And I'm not talking about remains. They may, that may be part of it as well. But the fact that they lived there, they emoted there, they existed there, means they are still there. And we have a connection to those places and to the people that were there. Back in the 90s, in those early days, I did my first rebirth. And it wasn't the tragic story of a uh, construction site destroying one of our, our places. Fortunately, it was a little bit more natural than that. Uh, that year, there was a huge rain uh, that came through, and uh, the water level came, became very high in the lower part of the Sinus River, right outside Pastor Lopez. And the bank of, a, of the river had washed out. And out of that, the bank, where, where bones were sticking out. Mm -hmm. So the local farmer, that was his property right above the bank, found them, called the coroner. The coroner came and excavated. It was a full intact burial of about a 12-year-old girl. And it was dated to about 7,000 years. Mm -hmm. So we went through the process, and finally the coroner gave, actually allowed us to rebury it directly. And we contacted the, the property owner, and they said, you know, we came and surveyed the area, and they allowed us to come and rebury that girl. And I remember when we got the remains back, one of our tribal members went to the coroner's office in Monterey and picked up her remains and put it in the back in a blanket inside of a container, especially made container. And I remember opening the lid of the trunk where the young girl was, our relative bursting into tears with all the other people around us also bursting into tears. We felt connected. That is real to us. It is not an abstraction. These things are not abstractions to us. We feel as connected as I think Adam said about time being an abstract itself. We don't think of it as 7,000 years ago so it doesn't count, right? In modern society sometimes we're not even thinking of anything past our great-great-grandparents now an abstraction and historical, you know, note to me. Not for us. 7,000 years ago, that was our little sister. That was our little daughter. That was our relative. And we're going to put her back where she belongs. And we did ceremony to do that. That's the context in which we deal with these sites that you know, that, that we know are in your hands, legally in the modern sense, to take care of. But our teaching, those stories that keep getting repeated every year, every year, every year, and all of a sudden, now we get it. And part of that understanding those stories share with us is that we were put here for a purpose. Creator put us in our homelands because we're very much location-based, not how we're modernly described as Kaluk, Kunyai, Ohlone, by language. That, that is not our way of describing ourselves. I am Tothral. When I say the word Tothral, it comes from a particular place at the base of our holy mountain where our creation stories say we came into the world. That is our reality. And we are directly connected to that over thousands of years and hundreds of ancestors. Hundreds of generations. That's what makes it significant for us. We are now trying to engage in the modern world and we now have native Archaeologists, including a few with, P with PhDs. We have Native Cultural Resource Managers. We have Native Tippos. We have a Native now at the head of the, uh, the Department of Interior. We're beginning to gauge not just with the tool set, but with an under bringing our understanding and our values to the table and slowly seeing the difference that's being made. And we hope that continues. 
I, I have every hope and, and anticipation that with the leadership in uh, Shippo's office, uh, with Julie and, and the rest of the staff, that that's going to continue. Thank you. the order that we purposely put it in and we hope it helped. Um, we've got a couple of minutes for questions. Um, I don't mean to ask you to criticize your own profession. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, often uh, everybody in academia gets accused of being you know, locked in a little tower with just those concerns that are important to that person. So, as, as things were evolving in the presentation, a uh, question emerged, uh, do you think every, well, first of all, practically speaking, does every archeologist get training in anthropology in California, or? You know, I think it depends. Undergrad is where I had anthropology training, that's where they divided up cultural, physical, linguistics, and archaeology, and then you had four splinter groups from the overall anthropological field. Uh, graduate school, not as much unless you had a bigger focus on ethnography, yeah. but not really. So, I mean, I think it depends on where you choose to focus on. Do you guys have a different answer to that? Yeah, I remember the, uh, the, the old timers, I recall the SCA you know, saying, you know, when, when I got there in the 90s, I said, when, they were cut up in archaeology, and their, a lot of their degrees are in anthropology. But the first time they met a native was when they were on the job site, and they're on one side of a ditch, and there's some angry Indians on the other side, and there's bones sticking out of the edge of the pit in between them. And there's a fight going on, and that's their first introduction to uh, native communities. Um, so there was no, uh, you know, what we try to do, and there's not enough of us that do this, is go into classrooms. We are invited sometimes, and when we can, go in and talk with an archaeologist. The, to be yeah. uh, and, and doing that, but there's not enough of it and, and it's still a gradual growing process uh, to get that to happen. Renee, you're a chair yeah. of a department. Yeah. 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 I used to be. Yeah. Yeah. I, used to be. Uh, I would say the same thing. It, it, it's uh, in the United States, uh, archaeology is embedded in anthropology and, and there's, a, there's a historical disgustingness about that and, and that's because anthropologists back in the day when these departments first formed were Euro and Euro-American people. And they were studying the other. They weren't studying themselves. So if you go to places like Europe, it, there, there's, it's separate out. It's more, it's, it's, it, they call it prehistory or history. It's not an anthropology. 
uh, because they're studying themselves in that sense. Um, and, and yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a history that's very difficult, and I think you, you use the word, Greg, appropriately many times, it's challenging. Uh, it's challenging to be an archeologist knowing that this history was there. Um, it, it, and it's a very emotional thing to do the archeology. span uh, it, it's, it's not something that's devoid of the personal sort of uh, pain that we, it's about the lack of representation in the field of archeology span or anthropology. It's the, the to see uh, indigenous people, see Native Americans becoming archeologists, doing the own work, uh, that to me makes sense. Uh, as somebody who has ancestry uh, from Mexico uh, and, and, and ancestry and connected to stuff the Pueblo, there are, if you're in the state of California, and, and there is a lack of representations of Latinos in the field. And, and, and it killed me from day one. Uh, there's 70%, I'm a dean at Cal State LA, 70% of our students are Latinos, and many of them have indigenous blood that link to, to Mexico and Central America. But there is a complete lack of representation still today in the SCAs. And that's why I went back home to LA to change that. Um, and, and to see that Greg is hopefully inspiring others to take up the mantle that he has done, that and the work that he has done to continue that, to represent. It's all about representing. Uh, and then with that representation, we can change how we relate to one another uh, and, and what we promote. Uh, that the idea of, of, of places, of, of, of place-based sort of origin, that's much more powerful than discrete loci, much more powerful than individual artifacts, because like what Craig said, mm -hmm. it links it all together into a cultural whole, and that's what's powerful. I'll just add to that, that even in our office, so it's not just in the SCA when we have new positions, we are desperate to make our staff look like our public, right? How do we make sure that that representation is in our office and how do we do that in the fields that we really need the expertise in archaeology and history and, um, and architecture. And it's really difficult for us to find people to even apply to the jobs at this moment, let alone be able to, to reach those diversity goals because it's so important for us to be sure we're doing that work in a connected way, right? So how are we, um, how are we teaching, bringing in students the, the people that are graduating now aren't diverse as much as we would like them to be in, in their representation. So how are we getting to those youth before they get to college? And how are we talking to them in a way that's bringing them up, giving them the tools to, to raise their own voices and be part of the conversation that we so desperately need? It's a very, very challenging time for us. And we keep struggling with it. I last Saturday was at a lecture at the California uh, um, Art Academy down in the Mission. And it was a talk about with uh, the head of the New Mexico State University Architecture Department is an United and World Member of the United Tribe. Um, so he's doing that there, but he's the only one. And so how do we help build capacity in ways that, that people, diverse communities, see themselves in, not how we see them? And then how do we make those pathways to be sure that we're, we're, we're making um, our workforce and, and our conversations in the right way? Other questions? Yeah. Um, I want to ask Governor May, um, you passed over very quickly that you were a coastal Numidian Min archaeologist, something like that. So what does that mean and why is that of interest to I, you? I, I, I sort of defined myself or was defined by the opportunities that I took advantage of as a young kid uh, to work in island and coastal settings. And um, why? because of the connection between humans and the sea. Uh, why? Because the sun sets and rises in these great waters. Uh, why? Because I've always been fascinated by marine environments. Um, so when I talk about middens, I, 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 I'm very much interested in those deposits that represent sort of uh, that connection to the environment. So the seashells that were collected, uh, gathered, process that were consumed, that were turned into artifacts, uh, that were left on the ground. Um, the, the fish uh, that, were, that were fished from the waters, I was just always fascinated by that connection. And so 
so I continue with that. And to me, it's those what are called middens, those deposits that are usually lined uh, on the seashore uh, contain that kind of information. Uh, and, and it's very different, so in Baja, California, where I work as well, it, it's the same thing that I'm focused on, on the seashore. Um, in Ireland, it's, it's, it's an ecclesiastical site, totally different um, and completely foreign to my training. Uh, but has it very community based um, in County Donegal, Ireland, and it's a, an ecclesiastical site without middens, without coastal middens, but associated with St. Columbia or, or St. Columbia, who introduced Christianity to Scotland and an unbelievable um, archaeology. But the best part of it is that the people were there, uh, much like what Greg is telling in, 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 in his talk. Uh, that the people are there and care about not just the ecclesiastical site, but the surrounding landscape. They talk about the mountains, they talk about the rivers, they talk about the water, how it's all part of this. So, you know, peoples all over the world that have not lost that connection uh, feel that and, and see it as a much broader sense. So, uh, but yeah, that's why the coastal island is that I sort of took advantage of the teachings of my, of my forebears and uh, you know, was stuck on There are worse places to work. <laughs> there are. Good. All right, uh, that's time for us. So again, thank you everybody for coming. <laughs>